Revelation chapter number 2, and let's read the text again so that we have in, in mind where we've been and where the Holy Spirit is going to take us. Verse 12, uh, Jesus says that John the Apostle, the beloved Apostle, writes, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, or Pergamum, or however you want to pronounce it, write, These things saith he that has the sharp sword that has two edges. I know your works, and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is. And you hold fast my name, and you have not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto you quickly and will fight against you with the sword of my mouth. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows except the one that receives it. You would not believe how many people have read verse 17 and have come up to me and says, Pastor, what is that new name written in stone? And my quick answer is, <laughs> what's the last part of the verse say? Which no man knows. I don't know what the name in the stone is. Don't ask what the name in the stone is. I don't know what the name in the stone is. But we talked about last week, we started talking about this church, and Pergamos or Pergamum can be referred to as the church that compromised. Or it could be referred to as the worldly church. You know, I told you last week, it was Charles Haddon Spurgeon that said that the compromise is, a, is like a steep, slippery slope, or the pinnacle, if you will, the very top of a steep, slippery slope, one step on either way, on either direction, and he, and he said, you're on the downgrade. It was also Spurgeon that said so profoundly that he says, everywhere there's apathy or everywhere there's indifference. Nobody cares what's preached as long as it's short. As long as it's short. Some years ago, I read an article by a pretty famous evangelical pastor who in this article was loathing his disdain or speaking about his disdain of long sermons. And he endeavored, it was coming upon the new year, and he endeavored upon that new year coming up to I give my congregation this promise, my sermons will be less theological and more practical and shorter. Well, folks, I don't know anything any more practical than theology. When you take your theology out of your preaching, you have almost readily removed practicality. Now, oh yeah, you can take all theology and throw it to the wind and, and get rid of it altogether, and you can have some sermon for Christianettes, and you can come up with some type of uh, go around the barn to get to the front door type of application, but will it hold up to the scrutiny of Scripture? And when one takes out theology from its preaching, any application will not hold up to the scrutiny of Scripture. Let me tell you this, and you can quote me on this, that if application does not first begin theologically, it will not end up anywhere practically. I ain't like that, Jason. That's pretty good, isn't it? And I, that's original with me. If you read that somebody else said that, they, they listened to my YouTube video and they got it from me. Okay? If it doesn't start out theologically, then it'll go nowhere practically. Because any application that doesn't include rich, true theology isn't going to be truly applicable. It's not going to be applicable whatsoever. And so Jesus is referring and talking to a church here that is a worldly, compromising church. Now listen, it wasn't the whole church that was this way. 
You know, Jesus comes to the, this church and tells John to write. And we talked last week about the correspondent, what we first spoke about. And Jesus says, I'm the one that has the sword that has two edges. Now, folks, when the people of Pergamum had the pastor of that church read that to them, they had one thing and one thing in mind alone, and that would have been judgment. They understood the sword to be one thing and one thing only, judgment. And so they knew that when Jesus Christ said, I'm the one that's coming to you with a sharp sword with two edges. He knew, they knew that the Lord of the church was not coming to them with flowery words, but was coming to them in judgment. And this is the first church that we've looked at thus far where there's something negative said immediately out of the gate about the church. To the first church, the Lord goes on. I'm the first and the last. He introduces himself as the first and the last. To the second church, the church of Sardis, he introduces himself as the one who was dead and is now alive. But to the church at Pergamos, he introduces himself as the one that has the sharp sword with two edges. He says, I'm the one that's coming, and I'm coming with judgment. But not everything was bad in the church of Pergamum. There was a lot of things in this church that were, in fact, good. Jesus said of this church, he says, I know your works. He says, I know where you live. He says, I know that you live where Satan's throne, literally, where Satan's throne is. Now, we looked at last week that there could have been a couple of different things that could have been included as Satan's throne, We looked at the fact that Pergamum was the capital city of Asia Minor. And so Pergamum was was the most beautiful city of the seven cities mentioned in this letter. But Pergamum was also the home or the hub of Caesar worship. We also saw that with the church of Sardis. But it all began in Pergamum. Pergamum was the hub of building temples. In fact, Pergamum was the first city to build temples a temple to the emperor of Rome. And guess who that was? The first, the first emperor that called for the taxation of the people, the registration of the people. When Mary was great with child, that would have been Caesar Augustus. And so while Caesar Augustus was in leadership in Rome, Pergamum was the first city to actually build a temple to his worship. And these emperors received all that worship, and to not bow down to the emperor worship was to, in effect, sign your own death warrant and execution. So it could have been that Jesus was referring to Satan's throne being Pergamum because of the worship of emperors. But we also saw the worship of, a, of, a, of the god of healing by the name of Escalapios. And Escalapios was the, was, the, was the false Roman god of healing. And I told you last week that what they did in this temple is all over this temple was covered with non-poisonous snakes. And what the person that was, was seeking the healing would do is they would go into the temple and they would lie on the floor and they would allow these snakes to crawl over top of them, symbolically being touched by the God of healing, Escalapios, and would therefore, in their minds, receive healing. I also told you last week that every one of you have seen the false God, Escalapios, as you look on the, the door of an ambulance and you see the medical symbol and you see a snake wrapped around a brazen pole. For years, Christians are told, well, that's a reference to Moses and the brazen serpent in the wilderness. And that's a reference to Escalapios. And so every one of you has seen the false god of healing. And that was part of the temple worship that had its hub in Pergamum. And so Jesus says, I know that you're living, I know that you're remaining where the throne of Satan is. I believe that there probably could be a lot of places where could be in, in our country, in our land, that could be considered Satan's throne. Satan's ground, because keep this in mind, folks, Satan's throne is not in hell. Satan's throne is on the earth. Satan to to this day, understand this, Satan and his demons, the ones that are not incarcerated in the bottomless pit, 
Satan and his demons do not at this very moment inhabit hell. They inhabit the earth. Hell is a place of Satan's incarceration. The earth is a place of Satan's domination. And so this earth, this world is in fact where Satan's throne is. And he goes on, he says in, in verse 13, by a quick way of introduction, I know that you hold fast my name. Not everything in Pergamum was bad. There, were, there was a remnant. Isn't that good? God always has his remnant. God always, down through the ages, even when everyone else defects, God seemingly always has his people that maintain his name, that do not defile his name, and do not defile his faith. He says, I know that you dwell where Satan sees us. And he says, I know that you've held fast my name. I know that you haven't denied my faith. Look what he says in verse 13. Even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you. It is believed that Antipas at this time was the pastor of the church at Pergamum. And his, history tells us that, that Antipas was basically boiled alive in a brass bowl full of hot coals because he would not deny the faith. He would not bow the knee to Augustus. He would not bow the knee to Aesculapius. He would not bow the knee to Zeus. He would only bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ of the church and for that it cost him his life. So not everything in the church of Pergamum was bad. And you know, I like to read history. I, I, I did not major in history in college. I, of course, I majored in theology and minored in Greek and, and music. But I could see myself majoring in history because I like history. I, I like reading history. I, some history. Now, I had a boring, Brother Blue, I had an absolutely boring world history teacher in college. And, uh, you know, it was just dry. Um, and so, I mean, when you can mess up history for me, you've really done something. You're a really bad teacher if you can mess up history for me. Uh, those of you who don't like history, uh, I don't know how many of you like history or one of you, some of you say, I hate history. I love history. And the old adage says that if you don't understand history, you're doomed to repeat it. There's a lot of truth to that. A lot of truth to that. And so I've always enjoyed history. And I always enjoy reading about uh, the martyrs. I enjoy reading the church fathers. I, I enjoy reading about Polycarp, uh, the early church father, when he, was, when he was commanded to deny his faith. And he stood, hands, uh, he stood ready to face the, the flames and said to those who were going to execute him, for 80 and 6 years, my God has never done me wrong. How could I refuse his name now? And I just read that stuff, and it's it just, I'm overwhelmed with encouragement as I read these guys, and I can only silently pray and say, and say in my heart, dear God, I pray that if I live long enough, that I am given a choice of my life or my faith, that there would be no question. Take my life, it's not mine anyway, it belongs to another. You know, and we, can, and we can stand here and we can say that pretty boldly when we don't face the, the firing squad or we're not facing the flames. I can only pray that if there ever comes a time when I do face the flames for my faith, that I can be like Polycarp and I can be like Martin Luther and I can be like John Calvin and I can be like Zwingli and I can be like Whitfield and I can be like Edwards and I can be like William Carey and I can say, do what you will with my life. It belongs to another, but I will never deny my Christ. And that's what Antipas did. And so Jesus says of this church that even in the days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, you did not deny the faith and you held fast my name. What a privilege to be said by the Lord Jesus Christ to a church, you held fast my name. You did not deny my faith. But unfortunately, not everything was rosy in Pergamum. Not everything was good. And oh yeah, there was a remnant. But everything was not good. Because then we come to the fourth point, I believe we are in our outline, the, 
corresponded, the city, the church, the commendation, and now we're at the concern. Because there was a group of people in the church at Pergamum that there was some problems. Jesus says in verse 14, he says, but I have a few things against you because you have those there that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Even though it is true that the church at Pergamum held fast the name of Jesus Christ and that they did not deny the faith of Christ even in the face of death, it is true that not all was well with this church. And what that teaches us, folks, is that doctrinal impurity, if we're not careful, doctrinal impurity can, can harbor itself in a church. And any church at one at any time can be guilty of harboring the grossness of sins by harboring impure doctrine in the church. Now let me say to you this, folks, that in Emmanuel Baptist Church, your two pastors are dead serious about pure doctrine. So much to the fact that we had a friend stand in this pulpit and at one time, unbeknownst to us, say something that was doctrinally wrong. And we went to that friend and said, you say it again, we'll interrupt you and remove you from the pulpit. That's how serious we take doctrinal purity. Now, I'm not his friend on Facebook anymore, but that's how serious we take doctrinal purity, folks. Because we understand, by the grace of God, we understand that the tiniest bit of impure doctrine that enters a church in any means possible can harbor the smallest and grossest sins. Who was the philosopher? I can't remember his name. Uh, I'd have to look it up. It, it, I had it, but now it's gone. But he said this, I fear the Greeks even when they bear gifts. I fear the Greeks even when they bear gifts. Meaning, I don't ever trust them. Folks, don't ever, ever be tolerant of the smallest bit of doctrinal impurity. Because when we as a church or you as an individual become tolerant of the smallest bit of doctrinal impurity, then it's bound to grow. And there were those people in the church at Pergamum that were holding on to, Jesus says, holding on to false doctrine. Look what he says. I have this against you because you have there those that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now look at the word hold there. Doesn't seem to be very significant, but it's very it's a very significant word. Krateo in the Greek. And it literally means to be committed to something by holding on to it very strong. It's one thing to believe something and not be really passionate about it. But it is something else entirely to be passionately committed to something. Now to be passionately committed to something or to be in, in, in specifics to be passionately committed to truth is a good thing. Is a good thing. Is a good and noble thing. But what Jesus is saying here is that these believers in Pergamum were passionately committed toward false doctrine. That's what he means by the word krateo, hold on. There are those that hold to the doctrine of Balaam. They were passionate about this false doctrine. They were teaching this any opportunity that they had. And please note, 
Isn't it interesting that Jesus says that even though the church is said to be passionate about false doctrine, how he could even say anything commendable about the church. Oh, there were some there, like I've said, that were holding on to truth. But there was a growing number of people in the church that some way, somehow were being were associated with the church that were bringing false doctrine into the church. There were a growing number of people within the church at Pergamum that were on the, the doctrinal downgrade. There were some holding to the truth of the Lord, and that does not go unrecognized. That's why the Lord gave the commendation. But there are those people, folks, in the church at Pergamum that were tolerating false doctrine. They were tolerating error being taught and not confronting people about it. Folks, listen very clearly. The, the scriptures are very clear how the church should handle people bringing false doctrine into the church. In Titus chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says there, Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, a man that is a heretic, that's a man that teaches false doctrine, that's a woman that teaches false doctrine. Jesus doesn't overlook that. Jesus doesn't wink at it and say, well, it'll be okay, or say, well, there's enough truth there, it'll weed out the false. Jesus says, no, they're, they're a heretic. When a man is a heretic after the first and second admonition, rejecting. That's pretty clear, isn't it? When you have a person that comes into the church and teaches a false doctrine, you approach them and you admonish them with the truth and if they refuse to believe and receive the truth, Jesus, Paul said to Titus, reject that person. Titus, of course, being a pastor himself, Paul says, reject that person. Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sins being condemned of his self. Folks, this is not something that I'm just getting up here spitting about. This is something that is pervasive in the church because like the church at Pergamum, we have a whole slew of evangelical churches in America that refuse to practice church discipline as noted in Matthew 18, 15 to 18. By the way, also keep in mind that the Lord Jesus Christ takes the purity of the church so serious even to name people by name that are guilty of doctrinal heresy. Over the years, I have been, I don't know what word really to use to describe it, but I have been questioned about my use of using people's names in the pulpit that teach false doctrine. And I have been asked over the years, and maybe you've wondered and never asked. I'm glad you asked. But have asked, Pastor, why do you, I don't like the fact that you mention people's names. Why do you do it? And I say, I do it because Paul did it. Paul did it. Well, where? Glad you asked. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 20, Paul mentions two people by name, Hymenaeus and Alexander, who were in doctrinal error in the church. And Paul says so much to the fact that I have delivered them unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Even a man that was one time a faithful companion of the Apostle Paul, according to Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14. He called out as a deserter of the faith and a lover of the world in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. He says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14, the Apostle Paul intimates for us that Demas was a faithful companion of his. Now he calls him out by name as a deserter of the truth and a lover of the world. Jesus Christ is dead serious about truth 
in the church. I received uh, this week by way of uh, email three videos. And uh, for those of you who get involved in social media at all, you can go to my Facebook page and you can watch these videos. Uh, I received a few of these videos this week uh, from a friend in uh, Arizona um, who was featuring our good friend Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Community Church, a proclaiming Southern Baptist, the author of 40 Days of Purpose, The Purpose Driven Life, The Purpose Driven Church, in which he said in that book, I can bring anybody to faith in Christ if I find their felt needs. I don't have to give them the scripture. I just find their felt needs and I can bring them to Christ. Well, he's an example of error being pervasive and permeate, being, not pervasive, that's the right word, but permeating his mind and his ministry. In these three videos that, that I received this week, uh, Rick Warren had a sit-down personal interview with the church at Rome. He went to Rome and he sat down with, with, a, with a representative uh, of the Roman Catholic Church and did an interview about uh, the Pope, Pope uh, Benedict, um, and, uh, and other things regarding the church. To which he said this, and, and I have it on video, which he said this, he says this, quote, that this Pope has done, and this is a proclaiming Southern Baptist pastor, this Pope has done everything right. He is our Pope. Our Pope. Well, he's not my Pope. I only have one Holy Father, and that's the King of Glory. And when a man receives a title of Holy Father, which is a title that only is reserved for God Almighty, there's a problem. And I'm certainly not going to get on television, and I'm certainly not going to say from the pulpit that he is my Pope. And that he has done everything right. And he applauded the fact, he's in Orange County, California, he applauded the fact that right after Pope Benedict took over as Pope, that there was an article in the paper and the headlines read, if you like Pope Benedict, you will love Jesus. Well, that fits right in line with their abuse of the priesthood where when a, when a man is ordained in the priesthood, he calls himself in Latin, Alter Christus, which is translated, folks, another Christ. How anyone that knows the Bible can defend that? When a man, when a mere mortal man calls himself another Christ, how a minister of the gospel can defend that, or any Christian that understands the scriptures can defend that, I'll never understand. And that's an example, folks, of how doctrinal impurity starts seemingly small and just grows and grows and grows and grows. Now, I'm not telling you that, that Rick Warren is not a converted man. I don't know his heart. But I can tell you that if he receives the teachings of Rome, he receives a lie. And that's how false doctrine permeates the church. Now, the Lord in this passage is primarily concerned about two heresies that are being tolerated by the people in Pergamum. One has to do with an Old Testament character and the other has to do with a New Testament character. He says, first of all, he says there in verse number 14, that you have those that are holding on to the doctrine of Balaam. And of course, Balaam was an Old Testament prophet for hire. Balaam was a, was a prophet, a false prophet, and he basically went along with whoever had the highest price. And you can find the account of Balaam in Numbers chapter 22 through 25. Here's what's going on. Fearful of the Israelites because of what they had just uh, done to the Amorites, Balak, the king of Moab, hired Balaam to curse Israel. And you know what happened in the story. It's an, it's an amazing illustration 
of the absolute sovereignty of God that every time Balaam opened his mouth to curse Israel, a blessing came out. And Balaam was like, man, I didn't get my money's worth here. What's wrong with this dude? And so after three unsuccessful attempts to curse Israel, Balaam came up with another plan. He says, listen there, Kingy, since I can't curse them, I'll corrupt them. I'll corrupt them. If I can't do it from the outside in, then we'll go inside. And we'll do it on the inside. And Jesus says here in verse 14, you have those there that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Here's what Balaam decided to do. He says, King Balak, I don't want to give you your money back. So here's what I'm going to do. He says, every time I open my mouth, blessings just come out. And I can't do anything about that. But here's what I'll do. I'll introduce the men of Israel to the women of Moab. They'll marry these idol they'll, they'll meet rather these idolatrous Moabitist women. They'll marry them. They'll have children with them. And you've got your corrupted Israel. Did it work? Pretty good. Pretty good. Because most men who aren't spirit-filled will fall dead in front of a pretty woman. And so Balaam brought in the women of Moab into the camps of Israel. It debased the people of Israel and destroyed their spiritual power. Now, Balaam's plan exceeded, but not to the extent that he had hoped. Because what God did is that God intervened. He chastened Israel severely, executing 24,000 Israelites. God executed 24,000 of his own people because of immorality and idolatry. And folks, listen to me. If Jesus Christ, if God will, will execute 24,000 of his own people, do you think by any stretch of the imagination that in Revelation chapter 2 when he tells Pergamum that if you don't repent, I'm going to make war with you, do you think he's serious? And I think Jesus is serious to us as 21st century Emmanuel Baptist Church says, listen, if you allow this stuff in your church and you don't repent, I will come to you quickly and I will make war with you. Some of that, that action halted, some of that action on the earth part halted some of the uh, slide of Israel into immorality and idolatry. And that was the same thing that was going on in the church in Pergamum. There were some people in the church of Pergamum that were being, to, to, uh, were being seduced to believe the same things as Israelites. In fact, it was Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 that rebuked the Balaamites when he said, which have forsaken the right way, 2 Peter 2.15, and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. The Apostle Paul, folks, listen, points out what was, what is the doctrine of Balaam? Well, we understand what Balaam did. How does that relate to actual, what is the doctrine of Balaam? The doctrine of Balaam is basically this, folks, is the doctrine in the church that teaches that it is okay as a Christian to be mingled with the world. That's what the doctrine of Balaam is. It's okay to be a Christian and at the same time love the things 
of the world. I had a very good friend. I'm not going to tell you his name because many of you would know him. But I had a very good friend who was a very successful uh, business owner. I had another very good friend that was a member of this church uh, and we're for, we had common friendship with this third party business owner. This business owner maintained years of success and the Lord's blessing. He was a Christian man. He maintained years of success and the Lord's blessing. Until one day he decided to he needed a partner in his business. It was getting to be too much. And he needed a business partner. And the man that he had decided to go in partnership with was an unsaved man. This friend of mine that was a member of the church here that we shared mutual friendship with this gentleman came with tears and says, I have begged him. He says, I have gone to him and I have said, called him name by name. He says, I love you like a son. But what you're doing is wrong. The Bible is crystal clear that, a, that God's people should not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. He said he won't listen. He went ahead and he did his Merger, within five years, his family was gone, his business was bankrupt, and within 10 years, he was lying in his backyard as a result of a self-inflicted gun wound. And that's a friend of mine. Where did it start? It started the day where he bought into the doctrine of Balaam that said it's okay to be mingling with the world. As the Apostle Paul, folks, it points out to us the absurdity of the church trying to unite itself with the world when he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 14, but do not be equally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship does righteousness have with unrighteousness? And what communion does light have with darkness? And what concord has Christ with the devil? Or what part does he have, does, does he that believes with an infidel or an unbeliever? And what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch that which is unclean and I will receive you. And despite the graphic example of Israel, and the clear teaching of the Apostle Paul, which with this church would have been very familiar, Pergamum persisted to follow Balaam's teaching. They believed that you could attend pagan feasts with all the debauchery and all the sexual immorality and still join in worship of Christ. Because you need to understand something, folks, that part of worship in the ancient world, when they were worshiping false deities, was drunkenness and sexual orgies. That's how in the ancient world they worshiped the deities. They believed that as you were involved in drunkenness and these sexual orgies, that it lifted you to the heights of being able to commune with the gods. And so, the church of Pergamum bought into this. 
Oh yeah, there was a remnant. But there was a larger group there that was allowing and tolerating this type of teaching going on. James says it this way in James chapter 4 and verse 4. You adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship of the world makes you an enemy of God? Whoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust that war against the soul. Such compromise, folks, still goes on today, doesn't it? In massive forms. As people like Balaam stand in pulpits and appear to speak for God, but are motivated by greed and lead the church into sin. The second heresy involved a New Testament character. He says in verse 15, So thou also hast hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. You know, it's probably true that, that there was a good majority of the believers of Pergamon that did not participate in this. But it doesn't take but a very small group to spread the seed of indifference, to spread the seed of doctrinal heresy. As I said earlier, we're not sure what the doctrine of the Nicolaitans were, but it was very close to the doctrine of Balaam. But it was basically this. The people of the believers of the doctrine of Balaam and the people of the believers of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans could be the first people that believed in the doctrine of, of the Libertines. Now, what, what in the world you say is the doctrine of the Libertines? The doctrine of the Libertines says this. I have liberty in Christ. I can do anything. I have liberty. I have permission. I have freedom to do anything because I'm a Christian. I can sin all I want because I've got liberty. I'm a Christian. I can do this all I want. I can commit acts of unrighteousness all I want because I'm a Christian. I have liberty. Yes, do we have liberty in Christ? Absolutely you have liberty in Christ. But Paul doesn't stop there. He says, but just don't use our liberty as an occasion to the flesh. In other words, he says a true believer doesn't use the fact that he has liberty in Christ as an excuse to commit acts of sin. And inside of the church at Pergamum were people that were allowing and tolerating immorality, sexual immorality, and idolatry, and idolatrous worship under the heading of we have liberty. We're Christians. We can do whatever we want to do because we're believers. Folks, listen. We have liberty, no doubt. But when someone is a true believer, when someone has truly trusted Christ, their attitude is not going to be, hey, let me do this. I've got liberty. Man, I can have fun with this. I've got liberty. Man, let me go do this. Let me go act, uh, participate in this sin and that sin because, man, I have liberty. Jesus says, that's my problem with the church at Pergamon. They've got people there that are teaching their people, go do whatever you want. You've got liberty. You can do it all. Have fun. You've got liberty. No boundaries, right? Ford Motor Company. No rules. Out back. Right? That's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. That's the doctrine of Balaam. And Jesus Christ says, though you've got so many things going for you, this is a problem. You are tolerating in your church a doctrine that teaches that sexual immorality is okay. That idolatrous worship is okay. That being communed with the world is okay. Because you have liberty. I have another friend. Who was a. Minister of the gospel. And now he believes it's okay to have two wives. He's a friend. He's a brother. 
and he believes it's okay. He's bought into the doctrine of Balaam. He's bought into the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. <clears throat> Folks, in a nutshell, what is this doctrine that Jesus has such a problem with? It's a doctrine that says you can be a friend of the world and a friend of Christ at the same time. Folks, you're either a friend of the world or you're a friend with Christ. You can't ride the fence. Because Jesus, James says, if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. Well, we need to stop. Brother Blue, would you please pray for us? Father, thank you. <clears throat> that you remind us again tonight.